for another episode of Tim's Open Garden. Okay, so as you can see the basil um, is really doing well and it's, it's, it's now time to pull it out. As you can see it's grown quite big and what I really do need to do with these is to kind of stop them so it bushes out. Uh, but I don't want to do that at the same time as I plant them in the ground. So what I'll do is I'll plant them in the ground now and then in the next couple of weeks what I'll do is I'll just take the growing tip out. Now with, with most herbs they, they, they like um, being sort of pricked out or stopped. Um, so if you if you stop them, they'll they'll grow into a much better bush. So don't just leave them to grow um, by by picking at them. Um, they will grow a lot better, and they'll you know react to that really well. So all of the obviously we've got three different types of um, of um, basil here. We've got these these here, which is basically just sweet basil, as you can see, um, and then we've got this um, darker, uh, which is basically called crimson crimson king. And so what I'm going to be doing is planting this um, in the border next to the green out here, uh, which was originally intended for um, carrots, um, which, is, which is why it's so high, so carrot root fly can't go in there. But as I'm not growing carrots this year, what I'm going to be doing is putting the, um, putting the, um, the basil into here. The reason that that's good is because this is raised up off the ground, um, the ground is really fertile and it's not going to get too wet. Um, because basil doesn't like the ground to be overly wet. So what I can do is I can plant it in there and I can control um, how, how, how wet the soil is quite easily because it's, because it's raised up. So I've just dug that over, which is why it's looking uh, wet at the moment. And what I'll do now is I'll just plant the basil into this border. Okay, so just planting out the basil now. Um, I'm going to start at the back because um, it's not so easy to reach the back, to be honest with you, from here. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to plant the, the basil out. Um, it's about um, six inches or so apart. So what I'm going to do is just step over so I can actually reach. Um, right, okay, so here's the first plant. Now this was watered a couple of nights ago and I've left it so you can see a uh, nice root, root form on there. So I'll just get a few out so I can plant them in the back. And as I've got two different colours, what I'm going to do is try and make a bit of a pattern. Um, so, as I say, what I'm going to do is start in the middle here. I'm going to plant them at exactly the same height as they were in the original. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here. Uh, I'll just plant one here so you can actually see what I'm doing. I'm planting them at around six inches or so apart. Uh, you don't really want to be planting them any closer than that. Um, and as I say, they are exactly the same depth as they were in the tray. Now, I will give these um, a watering in, in a moment, um, just to get them started. I mean, this ground's reasonably damp anyway. And the one thing with um, basil is it, it likes to grow quickly. So it's quite a hungry plant, um, but it doesn't like being too wet. So that's the, that's the important thing. So you need to have nice, fertile soil. Um, but you don't want it to be in an area that's too wet. Obviously, if, if the ground is quite heavy, what I would suggest you do is um, um, add some gravel or sand, or, or try to build the level up a little bit, uh, which will reduce the amount of moisture that there is in the ground. So I'll just carry on planting these, and then as soon as it's finished, I shall um, show you. The other one quick note I'll say is um, slugs love um, any tender plant like this so what one thing you most certainly need to do as soon as you've watered is just sprinkle some slug pallets down now I actually put some slug pallets in here uh, before I dug it over um, and the 
these plants have actually been hardening off here as well until I move them around the side. So I'm reasonably confident that all the slugs that were potentially here have now been killed but just to be on the safe side what I'm going to do is as soon as I've watered these in I'm going to be putting some more slug pallets down. Um, and obviously I recommend you get the the slug pallets that aren't harmful to um, other creatures such as um, birds or hedgehogs and things um, if you can because they are um, better for the environment than um, the, you know the sort of the copper sulfate based ones uh, which are obviously poisonous to uh, wildlife so I'm just gonna as I say I'm just gonna carry on putting these in and then I'll show you as soon as it's all finished okay and that's it all planted so I don't know if you can see it but if you kind of squint you can almost see an England flag but uh, that's about as close as, as to patriotism as, as I guess but um, I've put all the uh, the green in the middle um, up the side and obviously the four corners have got the um, the red or the sort of the purple and um, the crimson but uh, that's the uh, that's the um, uh, the basil planted. What I will do is that the ground's reasonably um, damp already to be honest so I'm not gonna, um, it's, it's sort of reasonably damp but what I will do is give them a little bit of watering later on tonight uh, just to sprinkle in and I'll, as I say I'll put some um, slug pallets down as well just to make absolutely sure we've got no slugs in here. Um, but that's the basil planted and I'll show what that looks like um, in a couple of weeks. Okay, so a quick update on the, the comfrey juice. If we look in the top, uh, you can see that the, um, that the that the tiles actually dropped probably by about, well that was almost at the top, so that's dropped about sort of a foot almost really. So all we need to do now is just, um, this, is the, this is the valve here, and all I've got is um, at the bottom attached a, a pot bottle. So if I now open the valve, so this is not easy to do with a camera in your hand. There you go. So that's the that's the comfort juice draining out. And as you can see, it's quite concentrated. Um, you know, you get this sort of black or sort of dark brown um, liquid coming out. Now I've already drained off out of this tub. I've already drained off a full bottle. So this is the second bottle. Um, now, when you're watering your tomatoes, you, you need to dilute this down to probably around um, sort of ten to one. Uh, no stronger than that. Um, so if you put in um, about an inch worth out of the bottle, um, that'll that'll um, do a you know a full gallon um, in the uh, watering can. So uh, as, as soon as you've drained all the remainder of the uh, the juice off, there's not really much juice going to come back off this now. So uh, I'm just going to leave that draining there uh, for the rest to um, to come out. Now all we need to do now is the what's what's left inside. Um, you can um, just put that on your compost and then that will add to your normal compost. And obviously we've got comfrey growing again there. But uh, the comfrey around here, um, as you can see, that's now finished flowering. So the bees have had their, uh, the nectar and everything out of that. So what I want to do now is in exactly the same way as I did the other week and I showed you. Is just chop that down with the, um, with the head shears into small pieces. And then put that um, into the tub and then that will make the next... Um, the next batch of uh, comfrey juice. So you can see, uh, just in here, this is the this is the first bottle that I um, took off. So I've already got a bottle there of comfrey juice. Now that will that will last me probably about um, three or four weeks in the in the uh, the greenhouse. Um, so you know it does last quite a long time. So to water all of these uh, tomatoes in here, you know that will last three or four weeks because you only need to you know you need an inch or so in there. Um, in, in a watering can which will do uh, one side and then that will um, that will basically feed all of these tomatoes um, you know for a week if it's got one f uh, fruit trust which is why I explained before you water so this plant here has got one two three fruit trusses on so what, so what I'd want to do is put about an inch of that in a watering can and water these three times a week so as you can imagine um, I'll need I'll need sort of three inches a week or, or so. So that that bottle there 
will last me about kind of three weeks and most certainly uh, with this second bottle here you can see now it's just finishing draining off um, so I've out of this out of this container I've got probably probably out of bottle and three quarters uh, which will basically um, fertilize the greenhouse for um, well at, at least a month if not more but by the time um, I've got most of the way through that obviously the second batch will be um, will be on its way so if you've got a tub this size and two two areas of comfrey um, that's more than enough to supply a greenhouse of this size with um, comfrey juice for the season okay so there's the second bottle finished as you can see I've probably got about just just over three quarters of a bottle now there's not much scent to it at all obviously as I say if you if you don't put any water in uh, with the comfrey you know you don't get much of a smell there's a slight smell to it but uh, nothing uh, you, you, you know not a bad smell at all so all I've done there is put the lid on um, and then that will store quite happily for um, six months or so in your greenhouse if you're not going to use it straight away but um, as I say I've got pretty much two bottles out of um, that box there and then that will last me now for um, at least a month or so most certainly up until the point where the uh, the new batch is ready okay the sweet peas are doing really well um, now what I tend to do is these are if you want sweet peas to last a, um, a good time pick pick the flowers off like that um, so basically what you do is you go down where the stalk is go down to where it meets the main stalk and just put your thumb through it it will break off reasonably easily uh, like that and then put these put these all together and then cut them all off cleaning with a pair of scissors at the end tie them together and then you can form like a small bunch of flowers which you can put in a small vase in the house uh, and it'll leave a really nice scent in your house um, with with sweet peas they're the same as any plant if you if you leave the flowers on uh, most certainly the leave the flowers on to go to seed um, what will happen is the um, the plant will start to shut down so if you want your sweet peas to last um, a good time what you need to do is keep picking the flowers um, obviously I'll leave some up the allotment because they're nice up the allotment as well but uh, what I like to do is just pick as you can see you can very quickly pick a nice bunch of um, flowers um, and what you can do is these are, they make a nice gift to people as well to be honest with you so just pick a nice little bunch put a tie around them or a piece of string and then um, you can give those to somebody put them in a vase and then uh, it'll create a really nice scent in the house um, so there you go there's a nice little bunch obviously I can't, put, I can't arrange them well holding the camera but that's what they look like um, and then um, you will find that your plants will grow that much more um, vigorously and uh, will create a lot more flowers for you than if you just left them on the plant if you just leave them on the plant um, the, the, uh, the flowers will will most certainly um, turn into seed and then as soon as they do that the plant will start to shut itself down um, I don't know why but this side bear in mind these are all the same seed this side seems to be predominantly red and that side over there seems to be predominantly white and purple but that was just the look of the draw so um, pick about kind of that many there's a nice white one there but don't leave too many flowers actually on the plant um, because uh, as I say you know the plant will shut down on you if you're not careful so there you go so that's a nice nice bunch of sweet peas um, I'll just put a piece of string around that just to tie them together and then cut them all off at the same length at the end so they'll sit in the uh, sit in the um, in the vase and then they will last up to two weeks in the house um, make sure they're always in water and then change the water um, every sort of four or five days um, and then that'll um, That'll ensure that the, the sweet peas last as long as he can do in the uh, in the uh, in the house. So there you go. That's them um, nicely cut off with a pair of secateurs and um, tied in the middle just with a piece of string. So just put those in a little vase and uh, away you go. Okay. So this week in the greenhouse, I've had a bit of a problem. Um, the tomato that was there 
um, and also the one that was at the back there um, developed some kind of rot. Now I wasn't sure if it was um, if it was uh, blight um, because of the weather that we've been having. Now blight always attacks when it's humid um, and, and, and when it's hot. Um, those are the those are the ideal um, sort of. Um, conditions for blight to uh, develop in a greenhouse. Now, I didn't want to take any risk. Obviously, I've got all of these tomatoes on this side, uh, which are doing really well. There's absolutely no sign at all on this side of any um, anything that's um, caused me to have concern. But the two plants that were there and there um, were showing signs all the way up the stalk of um, sort of blight, something that looked like blight. So. What I did, I didn't want to take any risks at all because if you do get it in your greenhouse it's going to spread throughout the greenhouse incredibly quickly. So what I've done is I've taken out both plants as you can see um, and I've put them into the um, put them into the incinerator to burn um, to get rid of them that way, but uh, which, is, which is nowhere near the greenhouse. Um, so what I'm going to do is, as you know um, outside, I don't know if you can see, but there's, there's some tomato plants outside. What I'm going to do is pick uh, the best two out of there and just transplant them. Um, into here. Um, so if you do see any kinds of um, mould on the um, the leaves so what you get is you get like sort of spots forming on the leaves and if you look over the uh, back side of it it's all the way through the leaf. Um, it's like black rings and then you'll start to see stalks um, being damaged as well and you, you'll start to see them going dark and um, like fungus um, on the leaves. If you do get any of that um, be really vigilant obviously and if you do um, get it to the extent that I have take the plants out of the greenhouse because it's really not worth the risk because it will spread through your greenhouse really quickly. Okay so there you can see I've replaced um, that tomato there uh, and that one over there but continuing on with the um, the blight um, issues that you get in your greenhouse obviously you get it outside as well with potatoes um, because the well you, you can get blight on potatoes, tomatoes or um, or um, aubergines or eggplants because uh, they're all in the um, um, same family of plants. Obviously th there are other types of blight which are basically fungal um, that you also get on alliums, onions and garlic and things like that. But um, the, the blight I'm talking about is obviously the ones that go on the sort of deadly nightshade plants. Now the things you can do to um, uh, reduce the chance of getting it is one, ventilate the greenhouse, that's really important. So as you can see um, I've got the window open there, the window open there, and obviously at the top, and the door is always open as well. So there's always plenty of air coming through. But the one problem that I've got at the moment is I've got plenty of weeds growing in the bottom of the um, tomatoes, as you can see here. So what you need to do is kind of get in there and pull out all of the um, the weeds out from underneath, because what you want is to to have a really nice um, airflow underneath the underneath the uh, the tomato plants and that's really important and this is also um, the, the airflow around the bottom of the plant is also improved by removing some of the um, the bottom leaves so as soon as your plant gets to kind of this big where it's kind of four foot or so high what you can do is start to take off these um, lower leaves here um, because the uh, basically the leaves will um, prevent the the air from circulating around the bottom of the plant, and that's typically where the uh, the blight will start. Because obviously, because you're watering the plants at the bottom, um, that's where the the moisture is or the humidity, um, and that's where the um, that's where the blight is more more likely than not to start. So by taking out all of these weeds um, at the bottom here. Uh, what that's actually doing is it's increasing the, the amount of air that's flowing. As you can see at the back here, there's plenty of weeds. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a, um, a gourd growing here. So there's, there's all, as you can see, there's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff growing in here. And in, in, in a greenhouse environment, you know, it will grow sort of really quickly. And it's, it's surprising, actually, I find, that when you're weeding in um, this time of year in the greenhouse, um, that the, uh, you know, the amount of plants that you get through, so... That, that plant there, as you can see, this one here, that's actually a, um, this one, um, that's actually a um, Nicandra plant, which is, which is a plant that, um, that I've grown in here, and obviously I've had one that's run to seed, and now the seeds are all over the floor, so also what you want to do is take off any of these sort of side branches that you get. Now this tomato plant here, I've just noticed, I don't know if you can see, 
but uh, there's a there's a branch coming out of the back there so that's also um, undesirable so what you need to do is kind of get in um, here and then pull all of the pull all of the weeds out so that literally all you've got growing in in the greenhouse is uh, your tomato plants now that'll allow the air now you can see the difference that that's made uh, which is why I videoed it whilst I was doing it you can see now there's a lot more light coming through onto the plants um, the air is able to circulate that much better um, around the bottom of the plant so you're able to see them to water them um, but also um, you know the the air ventilation around the bottom of the plant is going to be greatly improved and um, that's going to minimise the risk of any kind of blight taking hold in your greenhouse. Um, so what I, will, what I will do or what I would advise is as soon as your plants get to um, a little bit bigger than this because this one here as you can see is only to there this one here you know I could potentially afford to take some of these um, the leaves off the bottom most certainly these bits here I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. Um, these leaves at the bottom here, you know, they can they can just come off. All I'm doing is basically just pushing the leaf down like that um, and pulling them out. And as you can see, now that's opened up the bottom of the plant, um, and that will most certainly prevent um, <coughs> that most certainly prevent any kind of fungal at the bottom. The other thing is as well is watering. You need to be careful watering tomatoes. You need to make sure that the damp at all times otherwise the the tomatoes can split and you can get bottom bottom end rot on the uh, the the, uh, the tomatoes as well um, but but what you can do at this time of year particularly when the plants are smaller you don't necessarily need to water quite as much as you would in um, in the sort of later parts of the, the year where the fruits are swelling so really in a border this big uh, with the hot weather that we've having, I'm only really putting two of these watering cans on. I could potentially put two or three on, uh, sorry, three or four on, um, and water this even more. But what you do is the plants are then sitting in water. You're increasing the moisture beyond where it needs to be, and that's only going to encourage. If the plants don't take in the water, the water is going to sit there in the greenhouse and just turn into humidity, which is the right conditions for blight. So if you um, minimise the water, if you, if you like, give the plant enough but not too much then it'll be less humid in the greenhouse and therefore you'll um, you get less chance of blight in the greenhouse. Okay so you can just see what a difference that's made um, at the bottom of the um, tomato plants now. So what I've done is I've taken off some of the bottom uh, bottom leaves from the plant, taken all the weeds out and believe it or not I've actually filled um, a truck full of weeds just from this side of the greenhouse. Um, now, in doing this, what it will do is it will enable the air to flow um, a lot easier um, around the bottom of the plants, which is obviously where you are likely to get the spores of the um, blight fungus starting. So, if you can keep it nice and clear at the back, um, and obviously ventilate as much as you possibly can to keep your doors and your windows open, um, then what that will do is it will minimise the risk of any blight forming in your greenhouse. Okay, just a really quick update on the um, the second lot of calabrese. As you can see, they've all sort of picked up and they're all growing. I mean, since these have been potted up, they've probably grown about an inch or so. They've got the second leaves well and truly out now, and in fact, there's there's, there's kind of third leaves forming in the middle. So these are growing uh, grown really well in the greenhouse, um, and they'll be um, ready to put out in the next couple of three weeks. So a quick update on the calabrese, as you can see, I've now cut all the tops off. Um, so I did this last night, so what I did is I went through, chopped all the tops off, and um, actually there's one there that I missed, I don't know if you can see. Um, so two stories, obviously, it, uh, as I explained, this is an F1 hybrid, so they all came at the same time, and obviously nobody can eat this, this much broccoli all in one go. So all you do is you chop it up into the florets, so, you know, sort of inch and a half or four four or five centimetre long florets um, and then wash them in, in um, clean cold water in the sink um, and then get a large sauce and bring that to the boil uh, with about um, you, know, you know sort of plenty of water in there so about um, about sort of a gallon of water um, bring that to the boil and then as soon as that's boiling you plummet the um, 
or put the uh, the calabrese um, florets into the um, the water, uh, leave them in there boiling. Uh, well, wait for it to come back up to the boil, and then leave it boiling for no more than sort of a minute, and then um, pour those out, and then instantly um, put them back into cold water to co to cool them back down. Um, bag it up, and then. Um, put it in your freezer. Now what I tend to do is bag it up in lots of one kilo which is a kind of bag about probably about as big as your hand sort of thing um, and then I just put that in the freezer and then as and when we need it um, to eat all you do is uh, take it out of the freezer and then you can then sort of quickly um, uh, defrost it and boil it and then that will that will um, supply my family for some months to come. Obviously that, that almost certainly supplies up until the next um, batch comes which will be in about um, sort of six to eight weeks time so what's going to happen with all of this now is all of this is going to be cleared out um, as I explained you know you can eat the leaves so if you wanted to eat the leaves like a uh, kale you can do but um, I'm predominantly going to give this what's left here to the chickens dig the ground over roughly just get all the weeds out and then firm the ground back down and then that'll be ready for the, um, the new calabrese plants um, to go in which will be probably ready in the next two or three weeks and then that'll be the uh, the winter winter batch of um, um, broccoli. Real quick update on the uh, cucumbers if you can see um, at the back there there's a cucumber which is pretty much ready now. With, with cucumbers as soon as they are ready um, and I'd, I'd strongly advise that you take them off. Reason being is um, what you want is the plant to you know continue. What the plant basically wants to do is um, develop its fruit and, and set its seed for next year. So if you keep taking off the cucumbers as and when they're ready, what it will do is it will encourage the rest of the cucumbers on the plant to develop. If you leave them on for any length of time, what you will get um, is you'll get fruit not forming because it believes that it's already got enough fruit on it. So if you keep taking the cucumbers off, it will encourage the rest of them to grow. So underneath here, as you can see, um, there are some cucumbers forming on the back. Um, they're not quite ready yet. Um, they're a different variety, but uh, that one there, I'll just put the camera in, that one there is most certainly ready. Um, to give you an idea, that's probably about three inches or so across. Um, so that's most certainly ready. Um, and this one over here, that one is most certainly going to be ready in the next uh, couple of days or so. So uh, the cucumbers are doing really well. So, I hope this episode was of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Chips Off the Garden.